among those of us who are specialists in this area, there's a kind of consensus that the Federalist did not persuade, we cannot prove, we cannot identify one person who was persuaded to vote yes in a ratification convention because he read the Federalist and was persuaded. So in other words, the idea that you're kind of taught in eighth grade and then in, in high school, you know, and then in law school, if you do that, is, well, here are these here are these papers that were used to go out and get the people to support the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That was their purpose, but we don't know that they did. James Madison wrote, I mean, there's so much stuff that either he was directly writing like the Federalist Papers or that he was editing and, and a yeah. zillion other things. Yeah. Is, is this a good point to talk about the Federalist Papers? Sure. Or do we need to sure, lead up to any, Is well, there anything else we should lead up to? Well, let me just say about them yeah. in general that they are highly, uh, their influence is highly exaggerated in the general understanding. Really? They, yes, because... I told I you I've got a bottle of wine that's called the Federalist. So okay. It's Madison's picture. Right. It's Maybe it's good room. wine, and I, I, if it's that uh, standard issue uh, uh, silhouette of Madison, I, I, it uh, is. I celebrate the person who designed the logo. But the thing <laughs> is, among those of us who are specialists in this area, there's a kind of consensus that the Federalist did not persuade, we cannot prove, we cannot identify one person who was persuaded to vote yes in a ratification convention because he read the Federalist and was persuaded. So in other words, the idea that you're kind of taught in eighth grade and then in, in high school, you know, and then in law school, if you do that, is, well, here are these here are these papers that were used to go out and get the people to support the Constitution. Mm -hmm. That was their purpose, but we don't know that they did. And in fact, um, by the time the last of them was published, that is, by the time the last of them was seen by anybody anywhere, eight states had already ratified the Constitution. So huh. clearly there are eight states that weren't persuaded by at least those last ones. And then there were, all, there were some states where none of them were published in any of the newspapers, and there was no state other than New York where they were all published. Besides which, in New York, it was not the Federalists that persuaded people to ratify the Constitution. We know that for a fact. What, what was it? Well, what happened was that by the time New York came around to considering and it, okay, well, maybe people, people don't know, but the Constitution says in Article 7 that the Constitution will go into effect among the ratifying states as soon as nine states have ratified, whether there are 13, so as soon as two-thirds of the states have ratified. Mm -hmm. And what that meant was that each state was supposed to have like a state legislative election, except it would be an election just for delegates to this convention mm -hmm. that would decide one question, do we agree, yes or no, to the Constitution. So um, by the time New York uh, met, um, oh, I, there were already, there were already uh, eight states that had ratified the Constitution. And then while the New York Convention was meeting, New Hampshire ratified, that made nine. Then Virginia did, that made 10. New York was going to be 11th. The, when they had their election in New York State for delegates to the ratification convention, two-thirds of them were people who had promised, a, vote for me and I'll vote no huh. in the convention. But when they had the convention, um, they got word while they were at it that New Hampshire had agreed that made nine, so now it's going to go into effect. Yeah. Then they heard Virginia had that made ten. Now it's really going to go into effect because George Washington can be the president. Right. Yeah. And so that leaves us, North Carolina, and Rhode Island. Well, we, if we stay out, we're going to have an independent country <laughs> of New York, North Carolina, Rhode Island. And then the Federalists from New York City had a newspaper publish an article that said, in case New York votes no on ratification, New York City will secede from New York State and join the Union as a state. Wow. So then you'd have the independent country of upstate New York. And at that point, the, uh, one of the leading anti-federalists in the convention made a speech in which he said, uh, we don't have a choice now, we have to vote yes. So notice I didn't mention the federalist in this whole discussion. Right? Yeah. It had nothing to do with it. That's really fascinating yeah. though, because I was going to ask you, before you started answering, I was going to ask you, well, would the states that had said no, would they have had any recourse? But basically they're saying their own they people. They were independent. Yeah. Actually, by the time George Washington was inaugurated president in April of 1789, there were 11 states that ratified the Constitution. So there were 22 senators. There were 11 states represented in the House of Representatives. Two of the 13 states were independent countries, North Carolina and Rhode Island. And they were treated as independent countries. And eventually they talked in Congress about the question, well, what should we do about the fact that Rhode Island won't join the Union? Maybe we should cut off trade with Rhode Island, make it a little, a little dot on the North American map that doesn't right. have free... Yeah, and anyway, finally, because, well, what else are we going to do? Rhode Island 
agreed to the Constitution. But when they first had their election in Rhode Island about, instead of having an election for ratification convention, as soon as the Philadelphia Convention ended and said, okay, here, you need to ratify the Constitution, become a member of the Union, um, Rhode Island had a, a referendum on should we have an election for a convention. Huh. And they voted like 90% no. We don't even want to vote on whether to vote no. We just no. Wow. <laughs> and so when they finally got around to uh, having it, um, most people were they were overwhelmingly opposed to it, but they finally ended up agreeing to it because what else are we going to do? The other 12 states are already in the United States. Right. And besides that, our staying out means they're talking about things like creating the judicial system, recommending a Bill of Rights. Rhode Island's got no congressman. They're not participating in any of this. They're going to end mm -hmm. up in the Union anyway, so they finally joined. What would Notice, again, the... this has nothing to do with the Federalist Papers. Yeah, right? so I still, I still want to get to the eighth grade <laughs> version of the Federalist Papers, but what okay. would have been the argument for people saying no at that point? I guess uh, there Rhode really Island. wasn't much left. You mean in right? Rhode Island? Yeah. Well, um, during the, this is going to be hard for people who are listening to understand, but in the 18th century, if you said money, like when I say money and you think of an image in your mind, money, mm -hmm. uh, that's not what they thought of. Uh, they thought of gold and silver coins, mm -hmm. right? What, that's called s specie. And what they had begun to do in Rhode Island was print notes, bank, what were called bank notes, we, paper money. And uh, printing this notes is just a way to in inflate your way out of debt. And so there were a lot of debtors in, in Rhode Island who liked this printing money and getting them out of debt, so they just kept voting for people in the legislature who would do this. Well, the Constitution said that a state could not make anything but gold or silver currency. Hmm. So in other words, if you join the union, you can't keep printing money. But Rhode Island had this paper money party that was not going to agree to this. Right. Yeah, that's why they put it off forever. Interesting. So, okay, yeah. so let's, do, let's just do... 1790 was when they joined the Union. Yeah, huh. it's over a year after Washington was inaugurated. All right, so I want to do the eighth grade version. Has of the nothing Federalist to do with the Federalist Papers. Papers. Oh, right, okay. But that's, why I want, <laughs> that's why I want to circle back there for a second. Because okay. That's really fascinating, and I don't think most people know that, that they didn't no. have the influence that we now believe them to have. Right. So for the eighth grade version of this, yeah. really he was just trying to get people on board signing the Constitution. That was, that was the general idea. Yeah. But what, what actually was in there? Like, was it, was it a real sales pitch? Yeah. Yeah, well, for people that just really don't know. Okay, what to know about the Federal, actually the people who, you keep saying the Federalist Papers and I keep saying the Federalist, the term, the title of the Federalist mm -hmm. Papers was not given to this document until 1961. That's, originally it was just called the Federalist and okay. the author was Publius, which was a pseudonym for John J. James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. Um, they wrote different essays, and there were two or three where we think probably oh, Madison guess. and Hamilton cooperated. Yeah, but anyway. Um, so that the was point, the, that was the compilation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they okay. they put them all together, and it's it's one series under the same pseudonym. Noted. Um, I will not make that error. Yeah, again. yeah. But the. Uh, the purpose of the series was that Hamilton lived in New York and he knew, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, that they had their election for a ratification convention in New York and two thirds of the people they elected voted no. So, or promised to vote no in the convention. So what do we do about this? Um, at the Philadelphia convention, Hamilton had been one of three delegates from New York. The other two left after a few weeks. They gave speeches in which they explained, we were sent here to propose amendments to the Articles of Confederation, not create a new government. And one of the two who left was the Chief Justice of New York. And when they got home to New York, the governor of New York was entirely against this, right? Hmm. He agreed with them entirely. We're not going to have a new constitution. We don't want any of this stuff. We don't want to transfer a lot of authority out of New York. And so, no, we're against it. So Hamilton knew that most people in the New York political establishment didn't like it. They had elections voted against it, what are we going to do? Well, I, maybe I could go directly to the people. So his idea was to have a series of newspaper essays, maybe to get voters to change their minds. I'm not going to persuade the governor or the chief justice, they're both definitely mm -hmm. set, but maybe through a newspaper series we could get people to change their minds. So it's kind of interesting. He, he went to a friend of his named Governor Morris, the guy who actually wrote the Constitution. So if you think of the, the expression, the actual Constitution, you see that fancy handwriting, that's yeah. Governor Morris's handwriting. He was one of the delegates from New York in the Philadelphia Convention, I mean from Pennsylvania in the Philadelphia Convention. Uh, he wrote the Constitution. Um, Hamilton asked Morris, will you please help me write this series of essays for the papers to persuade New Yorkers to support the Constitution. And Morris said, no, I don't write for newspapers. <laughs> so then he went to another friend of his, former congressman named William Durer, and he said, would you please write some essays? 
So Dura wrote three essays that were going to be in this series, and Hamilton read them and said, no, these aren't good enough. So Dura published them as a separate pamphlet. And then he talked to John Jay. John Jay was actually probably the most famous New Yorker at the time, and Jay said, yes, I'll do it. But after he wrote a couple of them, he got extremely sick. He was bedridden for weeks, and so he ended up writing only five of the 85 essays. So now Hamilton's, now what? And it turned out that this, this uh, Virginian congressman who had been in the Philadelphia Convention, Madison, was back in New York City where Congress was meeting. He was a member of Congress, too. Mm -hmm. And he asked Madison, well, would you help me write these for the newspaper? I've got to do something. And Madison said, sure, I'll do it. So that's why Madison ends up being kind of second most important author of the series. Um, the thing about the series is, in my book on Madison, James Madison, The Making of America, I devote a lot of space to the Federalists, not because it was important at the time, but for two reasons. One, it's important now. Uh -huh. People tend to, even people in Congress, the presidents, people who are on federal courts, they tend to start to answer the question, how do you understand the Constitution? By saying, well, here's what Federalist 48 says, mm -hmm. you know, so that's one thing. But another thing is that this is one of the most important things Madison did. Even if he, even if no one had read them, they're brilliant. Yeah. So you know, if you have a painter, you're writing a bu book about a painter, and he made a brilliant painting, and nobody saw it until last week, you'd you'd have a chapter on it because it's important. It's an interesting part of his life. So I think the fact that Madison was this brilliant political scientist sheds light on the rest of his career. He had an extremely important political career besides his career, the short-lived career as a political scientist. Yeah. So that's, that's why I paid him a lot of attention. Yeah. But the point is, and I said before I wrote this book about Madison partly because I thought his, his significance has been exaggerated in, in several ways. One is the Federalists didn't, didn't sell the Constitution. Actually, in the play Hamilton, yeah, it's fascinating, in the play yeah. Hamilton there's a song where, you know, you sold it, you wrote it, and all this stuff about Hamilton, which is all also totally yep. exaggerated. <laughs> uh -oh. Uh -oh. But the same thing goes for Hamilton, you know, the same series, it didn't, it didn't sell it. It's yeah. not true. They didn't make people ratify the Constitution, the two of them. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about politics instead of nonstop yelling, check out our politics playlist. And if you want to watch full interviews on a variety of topics, watch our full episode playlist all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.